Music has been part of every known human civilization. Musical instruments have been discovered that date back more than 40,000 years. So it may not surprise you that the first audio recording captured by humans will be a song. This is the earliest known audio recording of a human voice. Au Claire de Lune, captured by Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville in France in 1860. He had the idea of capturing a photograph of sound, but he had no method to play it back. He called his invention the phonograph. The first time anyone ever heard these recordings was in 2008, when Berkeley Labs developed technology to transfer the visual image into audible sound. Finally tonight, the amazing story of how modern digital technology opened up a window into the beginnings of recorded sound. At the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, we've been doing a project over the past few years uh, in close collaboration with the Library of Congress to develop a set of optical methods that would allow us to play back essentially any early recording um, without touching it. So if the recording is torn, broken, too delicate to touch, uh, that aspect uh, would not become become a, uh, necessarily a problem. Is that we have a kind of camera, it's the scientific camera that has very very high resolution and can collect information like a normal camera but it can also measure the third dimension. It can tell us the up and down, the depth of the object that we're photographing as well. And we trained that camera over the surface of this foil and we took large numbers of images that together are probably, you know, 4,000 megapixels or something of that scale, a very, very large image. But it was large enough that it contained in minute detail the undulations, the movements of the groove that Edison's machine had cut into this foil. Up until 2008, the consensus was that the earliest audio recordings were made by Thomas Edison. In 1877, Edison had been trying to find a way to record and replay telegraph messages. He connected a diaphragm to an embossing needle that pressed against a piece of tin foil. With enough pressure from sound, grooves were pressed into the tin foil with the needle. When he played that needle back through the grooves, it played back the sound. He called it the phonograph. Edison established the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company on January 24th, 1878. Exhibitions were held all over the country to show off the miracle of the 19th century. While there was initially great interest in the phonograph, it was largely seen as a novelty. The tin recordings were low quality, to say the least. The talking machine, as it was marketed, was a scientific breakthrough, but one without a lot of practical uses, due primarily to the recording surface being made from tin foil. The material would wear out or tear after only a few plays. Despite its marketing as a talking machine, Edison had other ideas for its use. He wrote to the North American Review in 1878 and talked about such other potential uses including, but not limited to, recording music, books read out loud, preservation of languages, talking toys, recording lectures by professors, and even recorded messages sent over the telephone. As odd as it may sound now, even though Edison himself mentioned recording music as one possible use for the cylinder, he did not intend the cylinder to be used for entertainment. He felt using his invention for entertainment would make people see it as a toy instead of as a tool for business. As amazing as it was, the general public quickly lost interest in a device that simply plays back a recorded voice that lasts no longer than two minutes. So Edison shifted his attention from the phonograph to other projects, including the light bulb. There were others that saw the potential in a device that could record and playback audio. 
Alexander Graham Bell and his apprentice, Charles Sumner Tainter, decided to pick up where Edison left off by making improvements to the existing cylinder phonograph, which they called the graphophone. They made two major changes to Edison's invention. First was that instead of using tinfoil, they used wax, which made for better sound quality that lasted much longer. Second was that instead of having sound grooves move up and down on the cylinder, they moved from side to side. The lateral cutting is what all disc records would eventually use. Once patents had been filed, Bell's Volta Laboratory created the Volta Graphophone Company in January 1886. Upon seeing the work done by Bell, Edison returned to work on improving the phonograph. As Bell had lifted ideas from Edison, likewise Edison lifted ideas from Bell. For example, Bell used a cylinder just as Edison had. However, Edison began making phonographs out of wax after Bell saw success in using wax instead of tinfoil. And in doing so, both men felt that the other was infringing on one another's patents and were preparing for litigation. What happened after this should be told as a separate story entirely. Ultimately, following litigation, manufacturing failures, and almost no one being able to turn a profit on cylinders for years, the companies agreed to cross-license each other's patents by the end of 1897. Another inventor named Emile Berliner, who had experience with capturing sound, also took an interest in Edison and Bell's inventions and began work in 1887 on a competitor to the cylinder with a completely different design. <laughs>